time to get started. I think everybody had a chance to join. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, today's webinar is about how to advance your vibration monitoring program using our batteryless continuous sensors. Uh, I'm sure you'll have questions along the way. Uh, this is a speed run, so I'm going to get through the presentation material. Um, but as questions come up, please feel free to use the Q&A box uh, inside your Zoom toolbar there. Uh, we'll queue those up. And then at the end, uh, my buddy Brian is going to hop on. He's our director of marketing, VP, I should say. And he's going to uh, help me uh, officiate the Q&A. So we'll try to get those. If we don't get to them during the meeting, because it's a short one, just a half hour, we'll reach out to you afterwards. If you type a, a chat in there, we'll have your email address. So we'll close the loop that way. All right. So uh, first things first, appreciate you logging on and joining us over the wire here. We don't typically like to do these things as webinars. We like to go meet our potential customers in person. Uh, you've probably been thinking about digital transformation for a long time. Now, whether you have the budget or the support to do it or not, you know that's another story. But given what we're all living through right now, I think it's a kind of unique moment uh, for us to apply solutions like these that allow people to be more efficient or have a better understanding of their physical assets when they can't be there in person. So thanks for being with us. And we're looking forward to meeting you in person soon. My name is Peter Woodman. I'm the principal sales engineer here at EverActive. I've actually been on the team since before we had a product. Uh, so we've been ushering these uh, batteryless wireless sensors out into the world. Uh, it's been neat to see this technology go from an idea and, and come to life. My aforementioned marketing VP told me I should come right out of the gate, very clear, and, uh, and talk about what we're going to be uh, focused on today. So no high level introduction. We'll start here and then I'll fill in the detail as we go. This little green cube you see here on your screen is the first of its kind. It's a screening tool for vibration analysts that's always on, continuously taking triaxial accelerometer data and sending it up to the cloud. Uh, the reason why we asked for vibration analysts to join us today is we think that this could, if we put it in the right hands, change your career. I'll explain a little bit more about that on later slides. Uh, but for now, I just wanted you to know that these little sentries sit out at the edge. Uh, they give you feedback through a new data stream, uh, which allows you to have insights into all of your machines or all of your customers' machines, both the motors and the driven equipment from anywhere in the world. Other solutions can provide you data, but none of them are batteryless and continuous. So those are the big points of uh, emphasis here. Wireless without stringing a conduit all over the plant, always on and operating, self-powered without ever needing a battery. That's probably the thing that blows people's minds the most, uh, what it is to be batteryless. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, there's five sources of energy that we can harvest from. Uh, four here on this slide. Uh, primarily what we're going to focus on here today are a temperature differential, so something that's hotter or cooler than the ambient air temperature, or a solar cell, the presence of light. Those are the two things that can power our machine health monitor. Those are a very small amount of energy, you know, not enough to power uh, conventional sensors that you've seen before uh, or other consumer electronics like a smartphone or something along those lines. Uh, it's just a, a trace amount of electricity. Uh, but the reason why we can use those and still have a sensor that runs continuously uh, we have the lowest power radios in the world, spun out of university research by our co-founders. Uh, that allows us to get away with uh, something that would be considered you know, noise in terms of the power budget for uh, competing solutions. Uh, so that university research has been spun into our products, uh, and that's our unfair advantage uh, here on, on powering our sensors. So our story starts back in 2012 uh, when the IBM Watson team predicted there would be a trillion IoT connected devices just three years later in 2015. 2015 came and went, and we were nowhere close to that number. And each successive prediction, that number shrank and shrank. Uh, today, we're somewhere in the teens to maybe 20 billion of IoT connected devices. And that's everything, wearables, all this other stuff. Uh, industrial IoT is just a fraction of that. So we're not getting close to the numbers we wanted to get to. Here, we think there's you know, one primary reason for that, and that's the battery problem. Um, you know, I've been in and out of hundreds of industrial and process environments. I've never met, uh, never once met somebody with a title battery changer. I've met a lot of maintenance techs who already have, you know, full plates of things to work on, but nobody with that job title. When you ask somebody to change a battery, uh, you're stealing cycles from a, a job they could be doing that's probably more technically demanding. I've also met a lot of maintenance planners and they're busy too. Uh, they're already busy without taking on this new role of auditing battery life across a huge fleet making sure they have the right batteries in stock and managing the dead ones when they come back. And if you miss scheduling one of those replacements, you lose data. So uh, the other piece here, this environmental tragedy, in order to make intrinsically safe batteries, manufacturers use heavy metals and they encase them in a way that they can't be easily recycled. Uh, so the majority of intrinsically safe batteries end up in landfills. To go back to that fictional battery changer person we talked about, 
they'd be very, very busy even if we had a 10-year battery. Uh, there'd be 274 million replacements per day as those batteries came off if we hit a trillion da uh, data points around the world in industrial environments. So that's one big piece, right? The, the logistics and the environmental piece, but there's also trade-offs involved. Uh, today, since people know these batteries are gonna be a burden, they're putting fewer sensors out there. Uh, maybe the top five or 10% of their assets are getting instrumented. But the sensors themselves make a trade-off too. They ration the amount of data they send to milk that battery out and try to get that multi-year life. Many of them fail anyways. Uh, the hardest conditions for batteries are extreme heat or cold, and a lot of industrial environments have both. Uh, so uh, even by trading off and sampling only a couple times an hour to a couple times a day, you're still only going to get battery life that you know lasts for some number of months to years. Ultimately, you have to get by with the minimum amount of data. It's a trade-off. You're not getting continuous streams of data. So, so we've got a, a product that's going to change that paradigm. And that's our machine health monitor. Uh, so here I've got a photo of a machine train, going to kind of walk you through it. Everywhere you see one of these little green cubes, that's our sensor. Uh, this little fin on the top as our uh, antenna that connects back to our IoT gateways and sends the data up to the cloud. Now on this particular machine train, we have a motor that runs sometimes near ambient temperature. Uh, so that thermoelectric generator will power us sometimes. But the photovoltaic harvester here uh, that harvests light, that'll uh, provide us energy in times when the motor has gone cool. On the driven equipment side, this is a boiler feed pump, so it's hot water. So we know if that's on, it's going to provide plenty of heat. So we don't need to bolster those uh, with solar cells. Now we have the ability to store energy too. Uh, so if this mach machine train were to shut off entirely, the sensors wouldn't shut off immediately. Uh, we don't use batteries, not even rechargeable batteries, because they have a limited number of cycles before they wear out. Uh, but we can store energy in the form of supercapacitor banks. So each one of these sensors has that on board, and that allows us to bank energy and coast for hours at a time. So if you have a process that goes up and down, the sensor doesn't have to shut off and turn on and shut off and turn on. Uh, it'll coast through those low periods and continue reporting. You'll see the curves drop off in vibration and temperature. Uh, and then when it picks back up, um, if the uh, sensor still has charge, it'll continuously report. Um, if you're off for a longer period of time, uh, the sensor will go into a sleep mode and wake up once the presence of light or heat is there once again. So. All right, so that's kind of the high level hardware review. I'm gonna pause the screen sharing here for a minute and show you the hardware in the room with me. Got a little motor here. Uh, actually, if you're viewing both panelists, double click me. That should make me more prominent. I'm gonna spotlight myself here so you can see my view. The can of Coke is just for scale, right? So you can see what we're looking at. It's a small motor. This one's like seven and a half horsepower uh, marathon. Um, here's our sensor. So you can see kind of the, the size. Uh, so on the front here, we have our cable connector that breaks out to our harvesters. That's a pretty standard USB-C pin out but we add a safety screw and a gasket to make sure it's waterproof. All of our sensors are IP66 rated, which means they can be indoors or outdoors in all four seasons, and they can survive spray down, you know, water jets, that sort of thing, uh, without, you know, without being compromised. Uh, we do have this little shield on the front. This black button's made out of Gore-Tex. That allows us to take an ambient temperature and humidity reading and not lose that waterproofness. Orientation guide on the side to show you which uh, direction the sensor data is coming from a wake up light on the top. And then we have a unique identifier on the side so you can tell the sensors apart. We do gather metadata at the time of install on these. So we'll take the tag number on the motor, the nameplate data uh, associated with this MAC address. We'll also get metadata about what room and location and area we're in. So when you get a notification, you know precisely which sensor it came from and where you should go to respond to it. Pop this base off here so I can show you our mounting options. So we take that screw off and this is magnetic. So if you have a magnetic motor, it'll hold it in any orientation, you know, vertical or otherwise. Uh, if you don't, if your motors are aluminum, we can epoxy this base down. It's pretty low cost. So if you swap the motor out, you could leave this behind. If you have a stud mount, you know, if you've spot faced the motors and they're threaded, uh, you can put a quarter inch screw in this mount as well. Uh, so if you have an existing perch there, we can leverage that. So I'll put this back together, place it. Inside here is a triaxial accelerometer. So from a single placement location, we'll get all three. There's also a magnetic field sensor uh, that tells us the rate of stator excitation that's coming to the motor from the VFD. Uh, and as I said, we take a, a temperature and humidity measurement right here too. So our power source for this is this thermoelectric generator. That's the primary power source. We have another one I'll show you in a moment as well uh, for solar. Uh, so the core of this is something called a Peltier device. 
it's two pieces of dissimilar metal. So you get this side warm. These fins are here to exaggerate the natural temperature difference that's already there, you know? So this is the cool side. Uh, and once we have heat, something like uh, not very much, about 15 degrees Fahrenheit temperature difference, uh, there will be enough electricity flowing out of this wire to power our sensor. As I said before, that's a trace amount. And I just want to give you a comparative. I'm wearing an Apple Watch here. This is considered the lowest power consumer electronics on the market. Uh, the top four consumers of energy in it are LTE, Wi-Fi, this screen, and Bluetooth low energy. So three of the top four are radios. Keep that in mind. It's kind of telling. Uh, the lowest of those four is Bluetooth low energy. It has a power budget of about 50 microwatts. And the way it gets away with that is it duty cycles itself off about 99% of the time, fires on in little blips each second to talk to my phone or my laptop to hit that 50 microwatt number. Our Evernet radio that's always on and always listening inside this sensor runs at 200 nanowatts, a thousand times lower than BLE. So if you tried to use a little harvester like this to, to power the watch, it wouldn't even boot. It's just far, far more power hungry than this little sensor. So I'm gonna stick this on. Wherever we place this, it'll also report the temperature. And I'll screw that in to my sensor. These cables are modular. We make them in a bunch of different lengths. So if you need to get 10 feet away to find a warm spot or to find light, uh, we can do that. And as I said before, they're weatherproofed with a little rubber gasket and a security screw. Here's one of our uh, solar cells. It's about the size of a playing card, maybe half the uh, thickness of a deck of playing cards. It's also magnetic, but there's screw holes in the corner where you can zip tie it or screw it in. And it uses that same cable connector. You can just daisy chain off of the thermoelectric generator and find anywhere where there's light and it'll click on. So. Obviously in a, a big machine train, you'd want multiple sensors. So we could put one on each side of the motor and on the driven equipment as well. So that's our hardware intro. I'm gonna turn my screen sharing back on and take a quick look at the software so you can see what happens once that data is flowing. All right. So once that data hits the cloud, uh, we can show you overall vibration levels here in a chart. Now, I said the sensor is continuous. It's always on. It reports once a minute. And you can see here as I drag through, we get each of those individual readings. Just a tremendous amount of data coming off that sensor. Uh, we're looking at a little over a day's worth of data right here. But if there's any areas that I want to uh, zoom in on, I can click and drag. See those over, overall vibration levels. And we can hover on each one. We keep every measurement we've ever taken online. So you can go back a week, a month, a year and see all the data we've ever gathered. So, uh, we also have our temperature tracking here. In addition to these overall vibration levels, we have a spectral analysis view too that gives you the FFT. So here's our frequency magnitude pairs. I can highlight an individual peak here, click on that. And you'll see down here, uh, well, for starters, I can uh, set a threshold and show that very quickly just by turning off any two axes. It'll isolate that. But. Uh, here, we can see now that our big one was tangential. So if I scroll down, we can grab a waterfall plot, or we can just look at the frequency magnitude pairs here in 2D. By hovering over it, it'll show you, you know, where those highest peaks are. We take the nine highest peaks and transmit those up to the cloud once a minute. So in our waterfall view here, you can see a 3D depiction of that data. Uh, I'm looking at the five most recent minutes here. Uh, we're on five minute centers, but we could go down to individual minutes. Uh, we could also stack up five days worth of data or five weeks or five months. Uh, we keep all that online for you. Looks like most of the action here is under 5,000 CPM. So you can zoom in and take a look and, and find those outliers when they pop up. Uh, we also keep a full kind of breadcrumb of history. So anytime there's an alert, you'd get notified based around a threshold. And then you can see who logged in and cleared that. Uh, so you, you have a good idea who's been checking in and monitoring your machines. All right. Obviously, uh, we don't expect you to spend all day mousing around in our web UI. Uh, we have a full suite of notifications, uh, so we can tip you off if something's wrong. Uh, that'll allow you to um, you know, approach greater scale, right? Our customers love us because we make this easy on them. We call their attention to only the things that need to be fixed. So. Have a few quotes here from our customers about uh, their favorite parts of the solution. Wanted to talk through those together with you. Uh, we made installation quick and easy for this maintenance leader. Uh, and it's true, 
uh, we don't just design and build sensors here. We have a full stack solution. We think of it as insights as a service. So we work together with you to make sure the system gets up and running as quickly as possible. Uh, you don't need any specialized tools or IoT knowledge. Uh, you can open the box up and start seeing data flowing to the cloud within minutes. Uh, each one of our gateways has an LTE modem that you know, uses 4G data, like a phone. Uh, so you don't have to um, spend a lot of time navigating how you're going to get backhaul connected. Uh, in fact, for many installations, we don't bother an IT guy. Uh, one of the things our customer here liked is we didn't talk to their IT guy once. About 95% of our installs run completely independent from our customer's IT. So we don't need their Wi-Fi access or an Ethernet drop to be run. Uh, as, uh, since we offer this as a service, it removes a lot of risk, right? Uh, we're going to make sure that the sensors and gateways are up and delivering that data. So you can focus on what it is you do best as a vibration analyst. And that's analyzing the, the output of the sensor data, making sure machines are running. Uh, this is an important one, I think. So we're in it together with you. Uh, since we have an all-in model, you know, if there's a damaged sensor, we'll ship you another one. If a gateway goes down, we're actually monitoring that on the back end. We have a service operations team that makes sure these things stay up and stay working. So you don't have to become a sensor expert or an IoT expert in order to uh, derive this data and use it to be impactful. So, so right out of the box, you have a solution that works. To go out and get this data, you're not adding a new maintenance task like uh, updating firmware and software on sensors. We do that over the year. Changing out batteries, you don't have to worry about that since they're self-powered. And we're delivering 24 seven continuous monitoring and alarming for these sensors. So. So that's what we're doing here. You know, looking at the data and thinking about where this belongs and what we're offering, I also want to talk about what we're not. And we're not uh, you know, a hipster te tech company that thinks sensors are going to replace vibration analysts. This quote here, machine learning and AI will predict the future and replace you know, the existing way of doing things. When customers come to us and say, yeah, we want to just bolt sensors on machines and, and fire our guys, that's not what we're about. Uh, we know we need your expertise. The sensor data is one piece of it. We're going to feed you that, and that'll make you more productive as a vibration analyst. A couple ways I think we do that really, really well. For starters, you're going to be able to expand your business and your reach to get to more customers and more machines by screening from anywhere. This is a quote from a vibration analyst uh, we talked to who's working with us, has installed this on his customer sites. He says he's not looking to pick up more accounts where he goes and does manual data collection every month. Uh, now he monitors remotely, and when he sees a problem, he and his, his customer can act on it. You know, he's not running routes any longer where he goes out and checks on machines that are good, right? 80 to 90% of the measurements you take on these machines, usually they're within spec. In our opinion, those are wasted trips. We want to cut down on those footsteps, automate that, and make your life easier. Second point, we think you can be more impactful when you're on site if you know what equipment's going to be a priority. So if you're still making that monthly visit, instead of spending that time running around taking measurements, you know, hey, when I go in, these are the three machines I want to check on first. Uh, as our vibration analyst friend said, my customer's money and my time is much more well spent screening than running around and trying to find problems with manual measurements. He talked about it kind of being like a needle in a haystack. We're going to raise to you what the most important uh, issues are uh, before you go on site, and then you can develop a battle plan to be more effective once you're there. But also figuring out you know, where those needles are, that's an important piece too. So since we're doing continuous reporting, that means you're never going to miss a measurement on equipment that, does, the equipment that doesn't run all the time. right? We had an example from one of our guys who said, hey, the equipment that doesn't run very often. And when I go in to do a maintenance, you know, usually I get it every other, every third trip, or I have to grab a guy, an operator, to come in and, and fire up this piece of equipment. And when they do that, it's not you know, the natural running state for the machine. It's synthetic. They're putting it under a, a fake load in that time just to test it. With continuous monitoring always running in the background, you'll never miss those measurements. Anytime that machine's running, you'll capture that data and you'll see genuine data from when the machine's being used in process. So, kind of an important piece. Uh, since we're measuring uh, once a minute and we keep all of our data online, uh, you can go back and get all those measurements. Recall any one of them down to the individual minute in the machine's history. Uh, and this applies even if you've swapped out a sensor. So as part of our service model, you know, things can happen, right? Somebody knocks a sensor off, it gets crushed, something like that. You can bolt a new one on, connect that to our cloud platform. It auto pairs to the gateway. We'll reassociate that asset and you'll be able to go back. 
Uh, and that means you get a long history with each machine. So you can look back at trends over months or even years uh, to see how that uh, machine's performed. Some of our competitors, they will nickel and dime you for access to this data, right? They'll say, you can get uh, 90 days worth of data and then you pay extra uh, to go back further than that. We didn't wanna do that. Uh, we believe this is your data. Uh, we actually have an API available where you can take this data and feed it to other systems too. So we spent a little bit of time looking in our cloud dashboard today, uh, but if you have another data lake you're building or another system where you wanna feed this data, it can contribute to things like your overall OEE picture, right? Uh, you'll have additional data points from all these parts of your process where you can go back continuously. Uh, if you're doing failure analysis on another part of the plant uh, or an, a, a large process where there's many pieces of data, uh, we can contribute and feed that too. But you still get access to this data from anywhere uh, in the cloud. And it, it's accessible from any modern web browser. So whether that's your phone or a tablet or a PC, there's no specialized applications that you need to load on. There's no servers that need to be available on premise uh, that you have to install or worry about. So whether you're standing next to the machine or working from home in your kitchen or just getting off the grid uh, you know, far away uh, from the machine, you'll still have access to that data anywhere and you can respond to those alerts. Now we are not just a, a, a machine health monitoring company. We're a sensor company that makes uh, solutions of many different kinds. Uh, so uh, we started with uh, steam trap monitoring, actually another application of ours a few years back. Uh, that's These on the left-hand side column here are harvesters and in the center, these are sensing modalities. Uh, so in the case of the machine health monitor we just looked at, uh, we saw that it's thermoelectric generator and a solar cell photovoltaic harvester. So these top two, and then these sensing modalities. Uh, so that's what's supported there. The unchecked boxes are harvesters that we've uh, qualified in the lab, but haven't productized yet. And sensing modalities that we're working on, once again, we've been able to do them successfully small scale. We just haven't uh, fully put them into a product. Uh, so if you think about um, adding some of these harvesters and these sensing modalities, you'll see where we're headed later this year and into next year. In the case of filters, we're looking at differential pressures on either side. We had customers who uh, are changing out filters on a time basis, knowing that some of them are good but they don't have a good indicator of when a, a filter has outlived its useful life. Uh, so by putting a batteryless continuous sensor on it, we'll be able to report back and say, hey, it's time to change this filter. Uh, corrosion, so measuring pipe thickness using ultrasound. Uh, that's a, another application we're working on. Uh, leak detection for compressed uh, air or gas. Also ultrasound or acoustic, you know, listening there for those. Very costly, uh, wasteful when those happen and checking for fouled or plugged heat exchangers, uh, an another application we're after here. So as you start to check off boxes from column A and column B and, and do permutations of those, you'll see where we're headed. And I, I would like to pause here and say, if there's something in your environment or your customer environment that would sit alongside a continuous vibration analysis sensor like ours, let's talk about it. Uh, we can rapidly prototype and bring products to market. As you can see here, it took us about a year from the time we conceived of the steam trap monitor uh, to bring it to market. Same thing for this machine health monitor. Uh, so this time next year, we could be talking about a product that's not on these slides uh, with this combination of parts that could serve your need. So. All right, that was a, a speed run. I know I threw a ton of information out there. I'm gonna give you a moment to pop questions in. Um, my uh, colleague, Brian, is gonna uh, administer the Q&A. So I'll have him kick off questions here in a moment once he's had a chance to gather those. Thanks, Pete. Uh, first question for you. Uh, what are the area classifications for the sensors? Oh, great question. We are class one div two. Um, so uh, we, we support operation at that level today. Uh, that was you know easier for us to get than our competitors. The biggest complication in making uh, electronic sensors intrinsically safe are the batteries. I had an old MacBook that swelled up like the case actually split uh, because the battery swelled up over time. So our competitors who are reliant upon batteries have to work really hard to make sure that doesn't happen because in an industrial environment, if you were to bust out a casing like that, you could have a hugely expensive catastrophe. So easier for us than them to get those certifications. We're at C1D2 today. Uh, we're exploring potential C1D1 applications. So if you have areas like that, reach out. Let's talk about it. We can give you a better timeline on that. All right. Pete, how long uh, will the sensors last without a harvesting source? Yeah, 
uh, hours. Uh, so if you have, let's say you're, you know, you're clipping along with your warm motor and, and light and then everything cuts off, uh, it's usually about eight hours of continuous operation after that. Now, during that time, you're going to be monitoring uh, flat curves. Uh, so what we put it on for, is, you know, what we put the supercapacitors on for are processes that go up and down. Right? Uh, but even if you went down and stayed down longer than that overnight, a long weekend, an entire season, uh, once you have heat and light present again, the sensors fire up within a few minutes. Uh, so they turn around pretty quick. Great. And uh, two more questions here, similar to the classification question. Are these okay for use out in the weather, outdoors? Yes. Yeah. I, you know, I sped kind of through that when we were talking about it here. But yeah, they are fully waterproof. Uh, so you can hit them with spray down. We've been in caustic areas, you know, where they're using spray down in food and beverage production environments. Uh, indoor and outdoor. Actually, we were outdoors uh, a few winters ago when the polar vortex hit the upper Midwest and it was 40 below zero. Uh, so we've seen that all the way up to steam tunnels in the south uh, with our partners there where the ambient temperature is 180 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, all without ever missing a measure. Great. Uh, thanks, Pete. Last question, and then uh, we can encourage anyone to, to reach out with questions directly that we weren't able to answer. Uh, what, what's the typical cost of the sensors and the platform and the general uh, business model for EverActive? You know, I probably should have had a slide about this. Um, and I said a couple of times before that we offer this as a service. Uh, and that's true. So we charge on a, a per sensor a model, essentially. The sensors, the harvesters, the gateways, the access to the cloud platform and API, our subject matter experts and our team monitoring the solution to make sure it stays up. That all comes in under one price. Uh, and uh, on a per sensor uh, cost, it starts at $25 a month. We can bring that number down uh, given the number of sensors you're doing or the length of the commitment. So if you had a really small facility and you're doing a handful of sensors and you wanted to try it for a year, you'd pay that price. Uh, if you're a, in a large environment or moving across multiple sites where there's hundreds or thousands of sensors, there are price breaks for that. And then those longer term commitments where you get into you know, contracts over a year in length, uh, we can bring that price down. Uh, reach out to us and let us know. We'll take an equipment list if you have one. Uh, give you an idea of where we fit, how many sensors you need, and we can get you quotes from there. So our, our sales team actually, um, I'm, I'm part of that team and I have a slide here for that. Uh, feel free to reach out to them, sales at everactive.com. Feel free to CC me, uh, but if, if you wanna talk business and next steps, I, I prefer that we start with that sales list just because after each one of these webinars, I get a bunch of emails into my inbox and we have folks there who can help me sort through them quicker. So I wanna make sure you don't get lost in the shuffle. So fastest response will come, come from there. So. All right, so we will wrap up uh, the rest of these questions and engage individually if there are any we didn't get to here on the call. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you running through this a quick half hour. I feel like it flew by. Uh, thanks again for the time and we'll talk soon.